And first up is uh, Simon Kemper from the National Archives of the Netherlands. And he will be talking about transcribing corrosive iron gall ink in the tropics. Very interesting topic because here you can also see um, that transcribers might not just be good for um, things that are hard to read because they're old, but also maybe because they are not in that good of a shape. So let's see what it's about. Um, is this thing on? Yeah, it is right. And uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I will be talking about something I've done in Indonesia and something I'm doing right now in the Netherlands as the uh, key user of Link Open Data. Uh, I'm also involved in entity processing and uh, helping Lisbeth with uh, the iceberg model from time to time. Um, you've probably seen her presentations uh, in the previous conferences. So um, I will be talking slightly about what you can do with using damaged material and combining it with um, material in a good preservation state and how that influences the character error rate and other statistics. But we'll be mainly talking about how to communicate with the users about the reli reliability of search results. Um, you know, you have, a, you have a whole list of metadata that you need to give to your users to give a good impression of what they can search for. And then once you start transcribing, digitizing, you create an illusion, which others have talked about, the illusion that you can search for everything in the archive. Obviously, as has been mentioned time and time again, not everything will be digitized. There will hardly be any archive capable of digitizing the entire holding. Other than that, the transcriptions differ and not everything is transcribed. But it's also about the quality of the records uh, that matters. And that's much more difficult to communicate or to calculate. So that question will be the main question today. Uh, so yeah, you have a list here, reliability of search results. I keep it vague specifically because I want to address the fact that whatever general statistics we use, CR, F1, loss, it also becomes more and more uh, appropriate to start thinking about corpus specific statistics that might be based on particularities of, let's say, uh, the Dusty's India Company archive, which I will be talking about today, but it could really be any archive, anything that's millions of records, you could develop statistics specifically and uh, uh, benchmark specifically for that archive. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a very crowded field in 17th, 18th century Dutch uh, transcription and natural language processing. There are more and more parties doing that. So it, it uh, pays off by also trying to compare these projects together and not only create more general uh, means of, of uh, evaluation, which are already there, but are not always sufficient, right? F1 scores, uh, character error rates, we all know that. They don't tell the full story. Uh, yeah, so obviously part of the fair uh, principles. Now, I will be talking about two main uh, initiative institutions. First, my own National Archives of the Netherlands. Uh, again, you've heard of uh, what Lisbeth has been doing in the last couple of years. Uh, there are some other initiatives that are now going on in the Huygens Institute, of which there are some people here too. Uh, they are specifically dealing with the letters and reports sent from Indonesia to or other colonies to the Netherlands. Uh, it's, it's about 5 million of records, uh, and they try to really create a very deep search model for that. That's much deeper than the one we created at the National Archives. Other than that, we're also dealing with maps. We uh, recently uh, partnered with a company called All Maps in uh, Amsterdam. It's also a partner of the National Library of the Netherlands, of Delft University. And we try to use triple IF maps and annotate those automatically, and then georeference them automatically. Uh, that's something that I will come back to in the end. It relates to the corrosion, right? I mean, you might at first think something different, but the geo features and corrosion, there is a similarity there in how you handle those and how you evaluate those. Uh, and then our triple store um, in which we connect all the data we collect, because I've also been talking about entities at the end. And not so much entities as, you know, making indices only, but also entities and the embedded text of entities as a way of evaluating transcriptions. So the other way around of what you usually do. Natural language processing also is a kind of feedback to what you did in previous step. Uh, if you want to, you can look at our uh, website, but it's not really essential for this presentation, so you can skip scanning that too. Then the other program, which I happen to have participated as well, I, I used to live in Indonesia for seven years uh, and was also part of this program, but obviously the main work was done by the great archivist there. Uh, think of uh, um, Kang Jajang, Ibu Risma, uh, Kang Haris, that means brother and mother, you know, you always uh, address your. your uh, colleagues like that in Indonesia, like a family, uh, and they're depicted here. And they actually did pioneering work. They started digitizing before we did in the Netherlands, or before many others did. Uh, there was a cooperation with a Dutch organization, the Quartz Foundation, 
uh, but they were the first, but they did it before there was HDR, before there was uh, um, natural, uh, there was natural language processing, but it didn't really apply it. So they retranscribed everything themselves. They didn't do the entire text though, they did the marginalia, they did the headings, there are those pieces of text that are, um, that kind of give a structure to the archive. Um, also, might, you might want to notice that they did about 1.2 million scans. Uh, we have many more uh, now, uh, but their material uh, remains useful. Uh, so I hope in the future there will be more collaboration between uh, the Andri, ICEP National, uh, the National Archive of Indonesia, and um, the Na Ar National Archive of the Netherlands for reasons which I will go to now. Uh, in general, just a side point, Indonesia has many more records relating to this colonial period. Uh, than we do in the Netherlands. So it's also really a treasure trove. Um, but they were not the first though. The Courts Foundation, the Net, uh, Archive uh, of Indonesia was not the first to really try to preserve these records in the tropics. Um, but there was a program, not really a program, it was more like a series of volumes uh, that was released about uh, more than 100 years before that. So uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, and that was uh, unlike many other volumes that were released on the VUC, uh, was really aimed at preserving the archive. They saw that uh, Dutch East India Company archive vanishing in front of them, and they said, what can we do? We just describe everything. And it took about four decades to do that, right? Uh, describe everything, in this case, means we transcribe the main records that kind of summarize the rest, uh, resulting to only about uh, 12,000 pages of published material, or 11,000 460 pages in published material, which could translate, if you take averages, uh, to about 14,000 uh, archival folio. Now, the thing is how to connect this and how to use this as ground truths. Right? We haven't really done that thus far, even though many of those sources they transcribed are highly corrosive and extremely difficult, even with people who are really good at pale paleography, to read nowadays. Some of them are still in a good state, but some of these uh, so called daily journals, uh, that which had to be digitized in that program I mentioned just now, they, they are basically like, like barcodes. You can only see black lines everywhere. And you don't really know what to make of it unless you really focus. And obviously creating ground truths then will be a very uh, laborious um, endeavor. So uh, what I did first is create a model for printed text that is nearly perfect, <laughs> right? The actual character error rate for this model, which was trained with microfilms and other uh, uh, damaged printed material, that was the first step is uh, 1.59, but if you actually apply it to a train set that was specifically, you know, these printed materials there, uh, the DAF registers, then you get 0.0.01% uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's, you almost need to, and the, the errors are in the superscripts, right? So you can actually immediately implement them. The problem is the lines differ, the lines of the published material and uh, the ones in the archive, they're not the same, so you need to have delimiters. How do you get these? That's the question. Um, to process the archival material, I used an adaptation of uh, Lisbeth Iceberg model, uh, which has a, a more varied uh, combination of handwritings from the National Archive. Uh, and, but in, in the initial model had everything in a good preservation state, so I didn't yet use the corrosive material for that model. I mean, we managed to uh, also structurally take out inconsistencies in the transcriptions. It was already done by the iceberg team, which you know, we just did that another time and we could uh, bring it down to 3.4, which is about 3% points better than the earlier model. But then we started adding the corrosive model, which is version three, right? Uh, no, character error goes up and you can expect that. <laughs> it's just more difficult the material, but it also means less overfitting. We added more of, of this basic corrosive material and the end model, we also added uh, faded out text. The character error rate goes up. But what do you see if you do separate train sets that the actual character error rate of the uh, of samples from the good states from a source in the good state of preservation is actually extremely low i think this one is a bit of an exaggeration i did some extra tests with tables it's probably around one between one and 1.5 so i would, would want to give a slight update here i don't want to be too optimistic uh but it's definitely a decrease from the three uh, percent what you saw earlier at the same time the severe ink corrosion from basically being very, very like that, probably around 80%, went to 33 uh, by adding uh, dozens of the transcriptions. Not yet those 14,000, right? They didn't do that yet. It's going to happen. But just those uh, a couple of dozens of them, which uh, manually edited the limiters. Now, you might think, what can you do with 33%? Uh, but you can actually, with these 33%, you can automatically detect the delimiters, allowing you to do the 14,000%. I wasn't able to 14,000 pages. 
right? So as long as you can distinguish the lines and create a script for cutting the printed material according to the archival material, you're just one step removed from actually implementing the 14,000 pages. And that was the aim of this particular test. Uh, so for the next presentation, I can perhaps tell you more about the entire set. But this one is already promising, right? Uh, cutting from three to about one is already a good uh, move ahead. And the errors that are occurring within the good preservation, uh, uh, this, the uh, material from the National Archive, is uh, mainly in these kind of things like superscripts or uh, uh, annotations that were crossing out other letters, or an N that really looks like a P. So uh, quite rare uh, scribal errors, perhaps, or scribal uh, oddities. Now, okay, so how about evaluating this? How do we actually, okay, we can do it with, we can do it with sample sets, we can do it with uh, character arrays, but can we go deeper than that? Can we get a better clue that if there's a huge hole uh, in, a, in a page or you see uh, the traces of termites or you see everything blackened and uh, the paper browning, can, can we tell more about it? Well, I'm not the first to ask this question. Uh, one other member of the uh, co-op uh, co um, who I worked with uh, at the, um, the digitization in Indonesia too, he was doing the website and uh, some of the uh, visualizations. Uh, he too, uh, Marco Rowling, had uh, done research on this. Uh, I think also sponsored by Transcribus, uh, I believe. Perhaps not, but at least in cooperation with Transcribus. Um, looking at particularly these kind of phenomena, right? Uh, uh, the corrosion caused by iron and gall ink, which is an ink that was most, as you most of you will know, was very commonly used in Europe, but also in the colonies. You might wonder, why don't they use, use Indian ink if they're there next, close to China and India anyway? They tried, but they never really were, were able to replicate that formula. So they mainly used Indian ink for stamps, and they kept using the same old iron gall ink with the same old uh, corrosive issues in their own administration. Uh, and once that administration moves from Europe to the tropics, obviously high temperature and humidity makes the effects of corrosion much worse. Uh, so burn throughs, hallowing, lacing, in which uh, it gets, uh, you, know, you get tracks and the whole piece of paper fall off, ghost writing, and you can have many more uh, with the other issues, strike throughs, whatever. Uh, but I guess as archivists or as researchers, you're familiar with uh, these uh, kind of issues. Uh, now, what Marco Rowling this was uh, trying to see what the break of point was for corrosion. How much time do I still have? Five minutes. Yeah, okay, well, 10 minutes. Five to 10. <laughs> Okay, well, we can perhaps do the question in the coffee break. Then. <laughs> uh, no, but what he found is that it's really the combination of issues, browning, corrosion, uh, holes, that uh, causes HDR to completely fail, right? To <laughs> go up to 100%. Uh, he did this based on histograms on uh, blur grades, um, but it was really, as he uh, very much admits himself, just a, a pioneering attempt at uh, you know, struggling with this issue. So these histograms were not really useful in the end. I mean, you can detect colors, but it doesn't really tell you how the HDR will look like. Uh, many more has been done since then. Uh, we all know these uh, um, many vo volume uh, publications. Um, it's often in image specification, really a matter of adding more GPUs, uh, tinkering with the model. Um, you know, the work with Transcubus also uh, engaged with very much. Uh, but what I like to propose today is a slightly uh, alternative method, which obviously only tries to complement this great work that has already been done. Um, like you can you can put marks, you can classify images like B, uh, E, and F. Uh, but what does it tell you about baselines? What does it tell you about uh, HDR? Uh, that was the main question I asked when I read Marco's piece two years ago. I mean, baselines also tell a story by themselves, and obviously they're based on image processing. But um, what happens if we can really calculate uh, these, uh, do calculations with the baselines themselves? But it only became possible thanks to Transcribus uh, about three months ago, it wasn't it? You released the baseline. Um, and I'm really amazed, I mean, I don't want to flatter, but uh, I'm, I'm really quite struck by how effective this baseline model training is. Uh, this text here, um, you cannot see them because I cut out a slide due to the 64 MB limit. It's apparently it's not really there. Uh, but these, it can actually even go to the holes, which creates a whole new set of issues. Like if it draws a line from uh, that eye over there to that other part, it mainly covers a hole. And what if you start, try to start transcribing it, or what if you add ground truths to it from hundreds or 150 years ago that actually still contain the text of that hole? Doesn't the computer at certain moments to start creating fiction, right? That the holes are big. 
it tries to insert something that um, yeah it cannot calculate. It's just a, a complete fictionist estimation. So yeah, for that uh, classification and looking at the image or second thing might still be useful. So the gray areas you just take them out of the transcription. Uh, you know, you take those coordinates and you say you remove the transcription altogether because the new model which I created can actually interpret all kinds of things there, which will very much be confusing to our users. Um, okay, so just shortly on the baseline model, as I really need to rush, rush up, uh, rush, uh, um, like we created three models, you see the, the more you add, the, actually the, the higher the loss, but that's uh, good because uh, we actually uh, have less overfit. So actually this model we see is much better than uh, the one that's just a general thing you probably have experienced yourself. Uh, loss doesn't always tell the full story, same with baselines, same with the character error rate. So we don't have this issue anymore. Uh, we finally can draw proper lines here and we can try to calculate the length and number, the averages on a particular base and notice outliners. Uh, uh, we can notice outliers there and then go to those particular pages and say, hey, we need to correct the baselines here. And thereby improve the model for them. So really at that stage, which you really want to have, where it's easy to train. Uh, now, entities, uh, we talked about this. Uh, we have uh, at once for around 90% now with our entities. Uh, we have about uh, 100,000 texts from this material, uh, the material uh, mainly from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, we have seven categories, places, persons, group designations, organizations, sexual references, quantities, and temporal references. Please ask me about this in the break. Um, but you can also look at the embedded text and search for that specifically and thereby alter the text and thereby also do evaluations on embeddings of entities, which is different from lines, right? I mean, it's a larger uh, syntax around an entity. Why should you do that? Because often those kind of syntaxes are frequently repeated. I mean, not every entity is in a sentence that occurs on every page in an archive, but certain uh, phrases indicate headings, indicate uh, the start of a letter, uh, indicates the end of a letter, uh, indicate the signing of a report. Uh, those are frequent and those are most often easiest for a model to learn because it just gets, has more ground truth on those particular uh, uh, phrases and those particular characters. So uh, you can also, you know, specialize in a way your evaluation system by focusing on those embedded texts from the entities. Uh, also using the fuzzy search model by uh, Marijn Kolen, when you look at uh, Liebenstein and the way in which these phrases might have variations but actually be still inher inherently the same. Um, like in the sample uh, set from Andri, you could, for instance, look at headings which are constantly the same, even though the holes and the corrosion will make it hardly readable. You just know time and time again it's the same. And we happen to have versions of the same documents in the archives in The Hague. So in that way, you can start combining these uh, key phrases, uh, not only for training purposes, but also for evaluatory purposes. Uh, how many minutes do we have? One, two? <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> So other than material from Tropic right? because most of you will not have the kind of material, at the National Archive, we still have a team, our best lead partners, scanning stuff in uh, countries like Indonesia, and we still get uh, that kind of material for our own digital holding. Um, we do have some, apparently, like Brazilian documents, uh, one of uh, our users just uh, discussed that with me yesterday, that are in a very bad uh, state. Yeah, there you are. Thank you for the, the comment yesterday. Uh, and there will be more, obviously, the National Archive does have uh, deteriorated documents, but perhaps not in the same state as you can see in the tropics. Uh, but maps, right? right? Maps are quite similar in many ways because they also have all these geo features. They have all kinds of uh, disruptings of the text. So we could use these techniques to improve our uh, um, automatic annotation of maps. And this is very important because in maps, uh, this is a model that is specifically trained for maps, baseline model. Uh, and you see it works, it does wonders. Not only with words or characters, also with features like houses or flags. Why do you need those? Because if you have a place name and then you have a little house next to it saying the settlement, that's the point. And if you have those points and those names, you can start doing automatic georeferencing uh, together with our partner All Maps. That's extremely important to immediately give a connotation to these place names, put them into a knowledge graph and co combine coordinates with place names and just create dynamic as it is. So that's, uh, there's a lot to be gained here. And interestingly, for this particular discussion today, this also shows how you can add a new level of evaluation by uh, combining, if you already know the coordinates, you can place these documents in a uh, DIS. 
system, like I did here, is this basically a page section, right? But then uh, with an image, I uh, put them to a GIS, and this completely, here you have the uh, transcriptions. Uh, by doing this kind of things, you can also start comparing the coordinates of the annotations. So if you have a map of 20 years earlier, you can see what the spelling variations are. So that's another way in which the domain in which you're working allows you to do particular kind of evaluations on your uh, transcriptions. That might be worth it if more people start doing this, and I hope so, because it's really exciting to do this, uh, <laughs> this kind of work. Uh, here's a text uh, from a different period, uh, which is a different illustration. Now, I have one slide after this. I guess uh, this is uh, good enough for you guys. Uh, right, um, just on this very last topic, as an extra before my time runs out, uh, the mapping uh, and also sometimes the transcribing of corrosive text does lead to uh, you know, questions on Unicodes too. Uh, but it's perhaps something for another discussion, another time, you know, how to be very, where to deal with all the symbology uh, on them. But that's really just an uh, annex to uh, the uh, discussion as well. Uh, okay, I hope uh, some questions might have arisen because of this talk, and please ask them. There you go. So, uh, can you wait just for a second? I'll give you the microphone. We can do one or two questions. So, we'll try to. Um, distribute the uh, time lost across all the presentations. Yeah. So if you have access to the original documents, uh, if you have access to the original documents, can you rescan them? Can you re illuminate them differently, image differently, and get more information? That's the exact part I uh, skipped. Uh, definitely you can. But are we as good as termites? You know, that's the question you can ask yourself. Because these bad damage, no, because you can create artificial. Uh, damage, right? You can also replicate damage to archives yourself with, with properly good preservation. So you might ask, do we even need the material from the tropics if we can just do it on our computer? In ACR, you actually do that. That's one of the steps you take. Uh, was that your question or were you asking something else? Perhaps, perhaps I missed your question. No, I was just thinking, uh, I mean, your damage, your like blotches, they're not completely saturated. You could possibly image differently. You could set up. Uh, yeah, you could try to do that, but it's basically better to leave it up to the uh, HCR process, whatever HCR you use, to not alter the image. So that's my and Marco also experience as well. To leave to make that part of the actual HCR process, not to create a different image, because then the evolution of systems, you try to create one set or one archive, and if you start altering them, increasing the uh, uh, dynamization, for instance, all kinds of things. You might yeah. actually decrease the consistency. So I prefer not to do that. I played around with it, but I didn't. But perhaps we should come back to the other point that was uh, make, it kind of relates to what you were saying, though. Um, in general, I think we should, the damage that was created in the tropics, that's very difficult to replicate. So we should, uh, you know, the, these, these, we could try to, a lot of people have tried to get artificial damage, but it's really better to use uh, the tropical material directly uh, as a kind of, you know, it might be something other people want to do also. Mm -hmm. Uh, about um, image pre-processing, I'd like to weigh in here too a little. Um, that can be of value, but it obviously doesn't scale that well because uh, that needs uh, a little bit of individual treatment as well because not all the damages will look the same. But um, if you have time and resources, then with image pre-processing, you can gain some extra quality. Right, right, right. So you can sort of um, weight certain features of the image more strongly, also with AI uh, pre-processing. So there's AI for that too. Yeah. For example, if you have too low resolution, yeah. then you can uh, do that, with, uh, can improve on that with the help of AI, for example. Yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. Or with uniform collections for yeah. that matter. Okay, um, we can do one more question if there is any. Otherwise, we can move on. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. And just a second, not leaving, letting you leave without a mug <laughs> because researchers need to keep their strength up and drink lots of coffee and tea or whatever they like. <laughs>